Okay, well, good morning again. Thanks to all of you for joining us today. My name is Jennifer Best, and I'm part of the development and engagement team at RPAP. Our team can be found across the province working in the realm of attraction and retention of healthcare providers. I'm hosting today's session from the Wood Buffalo region, specifically Nistuayu, which is a Cree word for where the three rivers meet, or better known as Fort McMurray. We are located in Treaty 8, which is the traditional territory of the Cree, the Dene, and the unceded territory of many Métis settlements. I am forever grateful to the Creator for our ability to live, work, and play on these sacred grounds. And I also wanted to acknowledge the Treaty 6 and 7 lands, which some of you may be joining us from today, that are in the province of Alberta. These lands are a gift which we all strive to protect in our best efforts of truth and reconciliation. Before we get going with today's session, I would like to share just a bit of housekeeping and information. As you'll likely have noticed, and if you're familiar with RPAP, you'll know that your video and sound is off for um, just an, an, an attempt to save on bandwidth. We know that there are some people out in our rural communities who struggle with internet connection, and we hope that this will be helpful. If you have questions, please be sure to use the chat box. We will do our best for watch for those, and we'll make sure that there's lots of time at the end of the session um, for presenters to answer. You will also have noticed that we are recording today's session as it should be available and it should be available for viewing once we have the opportunity to look at it and ensure the quality is suitable enough to share out. Today, we are thrilled to be bringing you this special edition of Fall Workshop Series. Uh, of which we've partnered with the Alberta Rural Mental Health Network and the Tamarack Institute. Before we get into today's session, the new ways of engaging with our rural communities with Lisa from Tamarack, we'll have Tim bringing us greetings um, over to you from the rural, Alberta Rural Mental Health Network. Great, it's thanks. Jen Thank you, Jennifer. Um, my name is Tim Neubauer and welcome. Good afternoon uh, to everyone who's joining us today. I'm with the Canadian Mental Health Association here in Alberta. Uh, but also uh, part of, as Jennifer said, the Rural Mental Health Network. Um, so we're excited again to partner with RPATH and Tamarack, um, three wonderful networks that are working across Canada and especially here in Alberta um, to connect people. And so our focus really is connecting people in rural communities um, to focus on how can we um, support and help, um, you know, just better mental health and well-being uh, across the province. So again, welcome everybody and looking forward to today's topic. Thanks, Tim. Uh, we at RPAP are also so pleased to be working with you and your organization in offering these workshops. So thank you. And now I will turn it over to Lisa from Tamarack. Lisa is a consulting director with the Tamarack Institute, and we are pleased to have her facilitating this session for us today. We're looking forward to learning all about new ways of engaging our rural communities. So thanks again, and over to you, Lisa. Thank you so much, Jennifer. It's great to be here. Uh, and I was uh, with you, I think, back in April as we were talking about community engagement. And so thank you for inviting me back. Uh, community engagement is a field that has been around for so long. It's integral to so much of the work and it is changing a lot. Uh, and so today we're here to talk about the ways that it's changing and how we can respond. Uh, so my in my role at Tamarack, uh, we I work in in the learning center area of our work, which is all centered on building capacity of people who are doing meaningful community change work across Canada and internationally as well. So I lead the community engagement work uh, and do a lot of working with different communities on how we can meaningfully and authentically engage our communities. So. In today's agenda, um, we're, we're, I'm going to present some uh, thoughts, ideas, examples uh, around new ways of engaging with our rural communities. Uh, so that will take kind of a presentation sharing format, and then we'll have um, some time for Q&A. So if you have questions uh, at any point, I'm going to invite you to use the Q&A uh, box as well. So feel free to be active in the chat and, sh and sharing uh, your thoughts and ideas and interacting with each other through the chat. Uh, if there's a specific question that you'd like to bring to the Q&A, I'm going to invite you to put it in the Q&A box at the bottom. And so you can see there the questions that people have asked, and you can also um, kind of click to choose questions that you want to be sure um, we discuss at the end. So as we were thinking about, you know, what, what is the focus areas for today as we think about 
uh, the state of community engagement, what's going on, what we need to do, what are the things that we're struggling with right now, what are the opportunities for engagement. The, the two questions that I'm going to focus our time on today is around how can we have more meaningful virtual engagement, knowing that this is something that will continue? Uh, so how can it how can it be more meaningful? You know, what what's the parts that we're struggling with uh, and how do we can we do that well? And then how do we engage well in a hybrid world? So as we think about emerging restrictions, emerging um, from the last kind of year and a half, what's 2022 going to look like? That's actually my first time saying 2022. It's a bit tricky. Uh, so what's that going to look like? And how are we thinking about a hybrid world, hybrid engagement? What's going to ensure that uh, hybrid engagement is successful? So let's jump into that first one. How can we have more meaningful virtual engagement? So I'm going to share some of my thoughts on what's changing, what, why is this important? And I invite you to share uh, your thoughts in the chat too. Um, I'm feeling, you know, we talk and hear a lot about Zoom fatigue. I think it's real. I think when we have, um, we, we've adapted really well and really quickly to virtual uh, tools, um, but it can often feel like there's no buffer between meetings, like even though we're staying put, we're appearing, you know, all over the place in, in that virtual setting. And I think it can be exhausting. Uh, and so I think if we're looking to engage virtually, we need to do all we can do uh, to respond to the very real needs of the people who are showing up uh, to our virtual engagements. I think there can be a sense of overload um, when we do know that we can connect more easily virtually. Um, oftentimes we kind of cram things into our day. There's no kind of buffer between meetings. Uh, and we may show up to a lot of meetings, um, but maybe we're feeling uh, a lack of connection, you know, and we're still craving that connection. And so the thought of being able to be in person uh, is really exciting. Um, but until then, and for all the meetings or, or sessions that will be virtual, uh, how can we bring connection to that? Uh, and I think also when a lot of things are done virtually, it's a bit easy for projects to get stuck and momentum to wane. Um, it's harder to have those um, to, to kind of move initiatives forward. And so let's talk about what we can do about it. What are some of the things that we can do to ensure meaningful virtual engagement? For me, I think picking the right methods of engagement and ones that emphasize relational over transactional uh, interactions is really important. We're going to talk more about that in a moment. Um, I think there's these great virtual tools that we're really comfortable with, but we're seeing a little bit of an overuse uh, or just a standard use of a Zoom meeting and a survey. Uh, they're tools that are really easy to use. Uh, they're quite accessible. Um, there's free tools out there. We're more comfortable with them. And so it can often be the default. It can be the thing that we use um, really frequently. Um, and then so it, as a result, can just feel kind of same old. We're not going into that, that kind of deeper, um, you know, how do we how do we show up in a space that feels innovative or creative or or different than than what we're uh, expecting? So I want to challenge ourselves to be creative. Uh, so I'm going to share some examples in just a moment. I think I think this one is a bit controversial. So I have it here uh, as a bold statement, but it's to challenge us rather than for it to be the rule. I think um, oftentimes we feel stuck because we're trying to engage everybody um, and we know that that is hard right now. And so my bold statement is that we should really try to engage those that are the must-haves. So I, wanna, I want us to ensure that our must-haves is meaningful so that we are thinking that our must have people to engage, that that's an inclusive and representative group and that we're designing for that. But the quantity of people we're engaging is something that we move away from as a, as a target. Um, I think right now, quality of engagement is more important than quantity of engagement. 
um, given like how we need to be respective of uh, respectful of how uh, people are doing um, of people's mental health when um, so much of this is virtual and there's been so much change afoot. And so I think I think if we set ourselves up as we think about our own engagement and we ask instead, who do we really need to engage? Whose voices do we need to ensure uh, a part of this conversation, part of this decision? And we set out with that question rather than the default of, okay, we want to try to reach as many people as possible and kind of blanket it out, right? And we don't want to design engagements for everybody. Let's design them in really intentional, purposeful ways. Uh, I think some other things that we can do to have more meaningful virtual engagement is to actually focus on our virtual facilitation skills. Um, it's something that, sorry, that we kind of were thrown into and a lot of people haven't, um, you know, taken the time to figure out how do you facilitate a virtual session well? And so I have a few tips for that. Uh, I think we can include connection activities as part of our, our calls. Um, and I think we need to get really clear with roles and next steps. And so this is my laundry list of things that I think we can do. And I'm going to go into several of these now with examples. This is uh, the community engagement planning canvas that I developed and I use when I'm designing community engagements. Uh, so why I wanted to mention this now, uh, I wanted to offer it to you. Uh, Connor will share a link in the chat as well and it will be shared out afterwards. Uh, but this, when we're designing virtual engagements, the key message I wanna share is that the why engage, this first box here about why we are engaging, asking that question, I think is the most critical thing right now. Starting with why is more important than ever. If we want to kind of take ourselves out of a virtual engagement rut, we need to first say, what are we truly needing? Why do we want to engage? And then once we define those goals around what we're hoping to do, then we can use that to then get really focused on the who. So as I just said, uh, make sure our who are the right people and really zero in on them and their needs. And then we need to get creative with the how. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna spend some time on the how now, but I wanna really, really uh, like shine a light on that point that we need to spend a lot of time thinking about our why we're engaging first in order to then do the how well. So just for example, if um, developing relationships a part it is one of our whys, if one of our goals, then we need our how, we need our methods of engagement to be really relational. Um, a survey is not relational. A survey is quite transactional. And so if building relationships is a core piece of what we're trying to do, then we need to make sure that our methods of engagement are really relational as well. And so that's why defining that why off the bat is absolutely critical to have meaningful virtual engagement. So when we look at the, the how, this is from IAP2. Uh, it's a core kind of theory in community engagement. And what I've done is just list examples of methods of engagement for each of these levels. So from left to right is deepening levels of engagement. Um, here are all the ways we can inform a community. Here is so many ways that we can consult. Here are so many ways that we can involve, et cetera. And so, what we can do if we're kind of finding ourselves in this virtual engagement rut, we can look to this list and say, all right, what are some different ways that I can consult? How can I, how can I do, um, do more than a poll or a survey? How can I do this more creatively? And so there's a link there as well to an index of engagement techniques if you want to explore any of these uh, methods more deeply. One thing that we can challenge ourselves um, on uh, is especially for that consult um, type level of engagement, we can challenge ourselves to move. Um, there's this great 
diagram that I'll show you. Uh, this is from um, Bang the Table, who are leaders in online engagement. And it's really interesting to think of our methods of engagement, of online engagement in these three ways. Is this a controlled environment? So controlled environments are one where somebody by themselves is responding to questions you're asking uh, and their responses go straight to the person asking the questions. Nobody else can see them individually. Mixed environments are ones where um, I may be sharing my responses, but then Connor can see what I'm sharing. So that can be really helpful because then Connor is able to see, oh, that's what Lisa thinks. That's what Sue thinks. Um, and so by doing that, it enables us to be more transparent, build connection, build empathy, because you're seeing what people are responding. And then in open environments, these are when community members can interact with each other. And so I'm offering this as a way to, as we want to think about more creative ways to engage, let's challenge ourselves or at least just gut check ourselves, you know, if we're defaulting to, okay, let's a, a, a controlled environment tool, let's consider how can we perhaps choose a tool that is in more a mixed or an open environment. I'm going to share one example um, of, of an Involve uh, project that I'm currently working on. And, you know, we could have, uh, basically, the project is that um, we're looking to celebrate and mark um, kind of the end of the pandemic coming out of, of the really tough time and, and thinking about community renewal. And so we've gathered a bunch of community partners to into a design jam. So this could have been, you know, a series of meetings, but instead we're positioning it as a design jam and structuring it as a design jam because it's more exciting. It feels like something new, something that people don't do frequently in their day to day. And just by doing this, by thinking about it more creatively, um, we have really, really great engagement. So what we've, I'll give you a taste of a design jam as an example. So we, we had about 80 people who came together in, on Zoom uh, and they represented a diversity of sectors, diversity of, of interests and backgrounds. And we invited them to reflect at the beginning of the session. So this is Mural. I'm not sure if you've used it. It's a just a virtual whiteboard. Um, and we use it a lot for collaboration virtually. Um, we find it easy to use and a way for people to interact with each other. So this would be an example of an open environment when we, if we think about that diagram, because people are able to interact with it directly with each other. And so in the beginning of the session, we invited people to reflect, um, so to really ground and, and kind of um, focus on the purpose of being in this meeting today. It was a two hour session. Uh, think about the last 18 months. What do you want to uh, be ensure you remember? Then we said, who do you want to thank? And we had people share ideas. We said, who do we want to, who, sorry, who do we think we collectively, what do we need to collectively reflect on? And then how can we imagine a more hopeful future? And so this was just a, a 10 minute reflection at the beginning of a session to allow people to individually share their thoughts and ideas um, with others. We then uh, went into groups and we had groups then share specific ideas of activities or things they could host with their own communities. So think about people in different neighborhoods, in different areas, um, you know, in your context, it could be in different towns or different uh, rural areas, each hosting their own events. And so this was a session to empower and equip them to say, what would you want to do in your own community? And so we had people brainstorm ideas they then grew the ideas in small groups. And then in our next session, they're going to be working on a prototype where they take a specific idea they're interested in and then develop it further. Say, what are the key components of your idea? A place to uh, sketch and create. Who needs to uh, be involved to make this idea real? And what resources would you need? 
So this is just an example of how oftentimes our defaults when we have a virtual meeting, uh, we kind of are stuck at discussion because we don't necessarily feel comfortable with tools to co-create or tools to work on something together. And so this is just an example that, that uh, I'm offering to, to inspire, you know, what, what does it look like to come at this more creatively? I'm going to share another example. Uh, so we do, uh, at Tamarack, we're doing a lot of work. Um, it's called Building Youth Futures uh, in uh, towns uh, and more rural areas uh, across Canada. Uh, and so for each of these uh, areas, we uh, started the initiative basically at when the pandemic hit last year uh, with, that was when we were about to launch things. Uh, and so we had to kind of pivot and figure out how do you engage virtually? Uh, and we, we had a lot of fun redesigning how we would do this. And I think the one main reason I want to share it with you is that the way that we now do things because of this virtual engagement, I don't think we'll go back completely to how we used to do it because there's been a lot of things that were great, that were, that were wonderful, that enabled more people to join. And so I think um, when we think about hybrid engagement, uh, this is an area that we can say, okay, what actually was really good uh, through this process, through the pivots that we've made? So you can see here that I've used uh, the planning canvas as a way to, um, to kind of represent what the engagement is and what, what it's all about. Uh, so basically um, the key engagement goals where we wanted to understand the key issues impacting youth in that community. We wanted to prioritize which issues are more important and we wanted to empower community leaders to take ownership of the plan that they created. So this was a collaborate on the level of engagement. And so the process that we went through, I'm gonna show you the live uh, mural for that one as well. Um, when we pivoted from this large group, so we used to do this like convene a hundred people into a room, get them to all work together on what was most important. And we needed to pivot with obviously large group gatherings, not being a thing, you know, in a community hall that you would do. And so, Instead, we said, okay, let's intentionally re uh, recruit a group of 20 people, 20 to 30, and work with that group. And so we spent a longer amount of time recruiting the right people. So um, who are the youth that need to be uh, involved? Um, let's make sure it's a, it's a cross section and not just one youth, you know, needing to represent everybody. Um, how uh, people from schools, people from government, people, uh, organizations serving youth. Let's, let's have uh, a really representative small group working together. So we, we worked with communities to recruit this group. Uh, and then uh, we, we held us uh, small group sessions to do some of the work off the bat. So with this example, we, we invited uh, the um, organizations serving youth to share some data around what the key issues facing that community. So we shared those out and then we asked um, what, uh, sorry, um, what's most pressing, you know, based on all the information that you heard, what's most pressing, um, what's happening now, what stands out for you? And so people shared out after hearing, after learning together, they shared out what they could see. Uh, they then did some brainstorming of what they wanted uh, their aspirational vision to be. Um, they, I'm going to zoom through a bunch of this because we met over um, three sessions to do this work. Uh, we talked about key issues you know, what are the things that are facing youth, safe spaces, opioid crisis, um, community connections. And then from there, we created what we're calling a plan on a page. So it's a way to communicate key issues. So what's happening, what's facing, uh, what are youth facing right now? What kinds of changes could we work on together? And what we said was, 
we want you to, for each of the 20 people who were there in the session, we invited them to have one-on-one conversations. So we said to each person, who are the five people you would want to share this plan with? And then we invited them in however they wanted to. So this is, this is where we bring in the relational side of things. So it could be a phone call. It could be a walk. It could be connecting one-on-one because that was safe. Um, share this, this one pager with somebody else whose voice needs to be part of this and get their thoughts. And so we had this small group session. Uh, we brought in data from, from elsewhere. Uh, the small group worked together. And then each of those 20 people named five people that they then could have a conversation with. And so each of the 20 people is speaking to five people. And then through that process, they're then getting feedback on what are the key issues and what are our areas that we could work on. And we then brought that back in the small group to revise. So we heard from close to 200 people all feeding into this plan, but we weren't trying to, in this virtual uh, way, trying to engage 200 people. We said, let's engage 20 and then equip them to engage others. So I think um, my hope in that by sharing this, we can say, all right, what are the simple ways that we can do meaningful virtual engagement with a smaller number and then equip them to engage uh, other people? So moving to uh, virtual sessions and trying to challenge ourselves to kind of enable them to be creative, enable them to be different, enable them to be spaces that, uh, that people are excited by. Um, I think I find um, this visual really helpful. It's from Co-Creative. And I think um, we, the question that I want to ask is, how can we create more meaningful and purposeful virtual sessions? And I think for this, it's about um, focusing on what are we trying to achieve? So I'm going to, I'm going to explain this, um, this visual to you. Um, So it's called the four agendas. And we can think about the different um, goals, uh, the different reasons um, why the thing that we're trying to achieve in the session. So it could be to connect, which is about building trusting relationships. Uh, It could be to align. So what is it that we're trying to do together? Uh, This could be to come up with a goal or an agreement. Uh, It could be to learn. So it could be to understand what the key issues are, what's going on with that segment of the population. Who are we trying to help? What what barriers are they facing? So that's the learning agenda. And then there's the making agenda. This is uh, where you're creating a work plan, creating a solution, designing something together. And so over the past year and a half, I have observations about what things are easy to do together in a virtual session and what is hard to do. Uh, So I'm going to share my thoughts and I'd love uh, for you to add your thoughts too on what you've noticed. So when I think about connecting, I think this has been something that's been hard to do virtually. You know, we miss the in-person connection, the while you're grabbing coffee, while you're grabbing a muffin, while, you know, while you're in person, you're able to connect. You don't need to be so focused on the agenda. Um, And so I think this is an area that we've struggled a little bit when we think about virtual engagement. Um, But I think it's really important. And so I've seen really great success making sure that we always do some sort of check-in, some sort of like, okay, how are you showing up to this session today? Allowing people to be kind of their whole selves. Um, but I do think it's hard. I think um, I think that sometimes with virtual sessions, we're so focused on efficiency and respecting people's time. You know, where we used to have an all day meeting, you don't have an all day, you know, virtual session. And so one thing that we've kind of, We've gotten rid of the connecting time as a result to be respectful, but then it's something we miss. And so I think this is one of the tricky attentions with virtual engagements. How can we do moments of connection in a virtual space? Um, I've noticed that one way that we can do this is if we have a group over 10, um, or using breakout groups 
uh, of smaller numbers, like even twos, threes, fives, so that people are able to work with individuals um, rather than feeling like, hey, I am 60 people on a call. So how do we have connection uh, in that space? With aligning, I think aligning is exactly what we need to do when we're convening people together at one time. So it's about that sense of the whole. You know, I'm an individual and there's lots of individuals on this uh, in this session, but what do they care about and what do we care about together? So I think aligning is something that we need to do when we are getting together. Learning is something that can take up a lot of time and sometimes my challenge is, um, or my challenge to you is that if there's a lot of information to share, you know, if somebody's presenting, um, you know, for 30 minutes of an hour call, oftentimes we ask questions like, why did we need to do that at that set time that day? Maybe it would be more respectful if we could share out a video or share out a recording or share out a reading or something for people to do on their own time. And then... Um, allow for the in-person, virtual, uh, in-person time to be discussion about what we learned. And so I think that's a, a, a shift that we can make. If we're wanting people to digest information, maybe we could send the information in advance uh, and ask people to, to read that. And then with the making agenda, this is my biggest learning. It's so hard to make something together in a virtual session. Um, in that example that I shared, when we were trying to wordsmith a vision, it can take it can take an hour or two to wordsmith a sentence on a virtual session. And so what I've noticed is that um, making when we have something to uh, to kind of turn it into reality, I'm suggesting that individuals do that between meetings and then for the actual session, they're asking for feedback. They're sharing back what they've created and then they, they get feedback from the group and then somebody goes away after the meeting, does some more tweaking and then brings it back. So I'm suggesting uh, feedback on things that have been made and, and it's harder to do deep making in a virtual uh, space. Uh, it, I'd love to hear your lessons learned too about what, how do we use our time together in really meaningful ways. Um, I, here are some, some of my um, observations about often where virtual sessions can go off track, um, you know, where connecting or check-ins can take way longer or sharebacks can take way longer than expected or an individual's, um, you know, question takes over an agenda. Um, and I have a, a bunch of tips. So I'm not going to go through these right now. I'm going to leave you with these slides um, so that you can do some uh, of your own processing too around, depending on um, what your goals are for a virtual session. One of the observations that I made is that sometimes um, we can end a virtual session, a virtual engagement with, without clear next steps or roles. And so I'm gonna share two, uh, two things that we have found really successful when, when looking to move an engagement forward. Uh, one is the wheel of uh, involvement. And so at the end of a session, an engagement session, we'll ask people, okay, you know, we had this great brainstorming, how involved do you want to be? Like, what role do you want to have moving forward? And so we'll use the poll function. This is um, what you're seeing on the screen uh, is a tool of like a one pager that if we're doing an in-person session uh, that I'll, we'll have people fill in. So we're saying, do you want to be part of the core team moving that idea forward? Do you want to be involved? Do you want to be supported or interested? And we'll have them check you know, put a tick on the area that they want to be involved in. And this has worked really well using the poll function. So as we're leaving a session, uh, we'll quickly whip up a poll in the session and say, okay, how uh, in the creation of the finalizing the work plan, do you want to be involved in that step? And so people are choosing for themselves, um, you know, do I want to be involved? Do I want to be uh, part of the core team? And that's been a really tangible way for people to art articulate their roles. Another tool that has worked really, really well um, is uh, using, this is from asset-based community development, where um, when we talk about moving ideas forward, we first ask, 
Is this something that we, a, group, a community group, can do for ourselves? Is this something that we need support with? Or is this something that we need somebody else to lead? And so we'll take a bunch of ideas that we've brainstormed in a session, and then we'll drag them and bucket them in these three areas. And so this could be, you can, you know, come up with whatever titles you want here, but this enables a community to say for themselves, based on our strengths and assets of our community, what can we do and where do we need support, which offers really, really tangible next steps. We can basically pick up that left bucket and give it to uh, community organizations. We can pick up a middle bucket and say, okay, um, this will be something for the association to take leadership on and involve the community. Um, and so instead of having a really, really great brainstorming session and then ideas kind of not knowing where they're going, this has been a really great tool for kind of picking up each bucket of ideas and ensuring that they have a home so that they could be made real. All right, so that was uh, was question one around how do we how can we ensure meaningful virtual engagement? What are some of the barriers that we're facing, and how can we approach them thoughtfully? The second area is around how can we engage well in a hybrid world. So, as we're thinking about um, you know things opening of hosting in-person engagements I think there's a lot of things that we're feeling many of us have different feelings about um, for some some people are just done with virtual they don't want to you know I'm exhausted I don't want to do it anymore and and they're just so eager to be in person and then for other people they're not ready for in person um, they're feeling more cautious and virtual has worked um, great for them. They haven't had to drive for an hour to go to the meeting. They haven't had to arrange babysitting uh, in order to attend. And so they've actually been able to show up to more things than they uh, were able to before. And so there's this real dichotomy in terms of um, what is more accessible and what are people wanting. And so uh it, it kind of then means that we need to design engagements that are hybrid. I don't think we're going to go back to uh, planning for a single big event and saying tough luck if you can't make it. You know, it, the future of engagement is about designing meaningful hybrid engagements. Uh, and so let's talk um, in our last little bit about what a good hybrid engagement looks like. What, how do we need to think about this moving forward? We need to plan for accessibility. Um, this is my favorite tool for um, if you want to go deep into what are the barriers that uh, that my community is facing and what are the real meaningful questions uh, to ask and what are possible strategies uh, to overcome those barriers. This is a fabulous resource. Um, and so I'll leave you with that. Um, for each of these bullets you see here, there's a page or two of ideas and great questions to ask. So as we think about um, the future of engagement, it's not this one size fits all, it's, it's lots of iterative engagement um, that builds upon each other. And so we need to do everything we can to ensure that it's inclusive and accessible. Um, we need to engage in ways that respond to those needs that, that people um, are uh, just facing different realities with their comfort. Um, and that we need to offer different formats to suit different people. I think this doesn't necessarily mean that where we used to design one thing, we're designing 20. I think we can design one thing and then adapt it, but it's not. I think the thing that we want to make sure that we're not doing is designing the face-to-face -face engagement as the main thing and then it being a subpar experience for people who are dialing in. You know, where when people are having great coffee breaks and, uh, you know, and the muffin breaks, the people who have dialed in are just like sitting there and aren't accommodated. Uh, and so there's things that we can do, like making sure that, you know, if we are setting up an event that does have people in person and people dialing in, we need to make sure that we're also connecting the people dialing in. Um, I 
you know, while I think it's it's fine to have events that have both, I actually prefer it when we separate those two things, when we host an in-person session and then we design specifically for people who are engaging virtually, you know, on the next day. We've already created all the materials. We don't have to recreate those, but we're designing a virtual experience that is wonderful and we're designing an in-person experience that's wonderful. And the, the, the last thing that I think we can do here is also share the role of doing the engaging. So for example, in that uh, youth example that I shared, um, it was equipping those 20 people to go out and engage themselves, you know, of empowering them with the ownership of the plan of the idea to share that and get feedback. Same thing with, you know, we can empower groups to host their own engagements. And I'll, I'll show you an example of that. When we think about um, our engagement toolkit, I find this just visual really helpful in the brainstorming phase. And so we can think about large group gatherings, we can think about small group, we can think about one-to-one, -one, and then we can think about self-directed. Um, so self-directed is anything somebody's doing individually on their own time. So it could be filling out a paper survey or an online survey or answering a question or, you know, something on their own time. One-to-one um, -one would be anything like a phone call, a walk, a text, uh, those, those kinds of things, um, or even a one-to-one -one email. So I think when we think about these, and I'm, we're designing engagements, it's kind of like we need to think about them building and flowing. You know, in that example, we have a small group and then the small group goes and does the one-to-one. -one. And then there's also an online tool that people can share their preferences or a discussion board. Um, or self-directed could also be an online document that everybody's adding their comments to. That's a perfect example of self-directed uh, as well. And so we need to think about how can we offer uh, defined and varied ways to contribute and not just have one of these, not just only small group or not just only self-directed. This last example uh, that I'll share um, is a data walk. So a data walk is one of our favorite tools uh, at Tamarack, it seems, uh, for make, sharing and making sense of data. You know, we know that if information has been collected um, about a certain community, um, we have this really rich data, but that data is not neutral and that how we make sense of that information, how it's interpreted um, is really important. And so in this example, uh, and I'll show you uh, what a data walk uh, looks like. So we basically take, um, and in this example, um, we met with a small group to, to determine which data is most important to share. You know, it was a hundred page report and that was overwhelming. And so we said, what is the key pieces of information that need to be shared? Uh, and so we worked with that diverse and representative group to, to choose, you know, what's the most important information. And so um, in this data walk, when it's done in person, it's kind of like a science fair, you know, where there's a posters all around the room. So imagine six different poster boards with a graph. And then we're asking people to um, visit each station for 10 minutes, react to the information. You know, does this surprise you? What does this tell you? And then say, what does that mean? You know, a probing question here. And so we, by having this group uh, identify the six pieces of data, we then host, can host an in-person data walk, but then also a virtual data walk. So, um, you know, we go to station one, we go to station two, we go to station three. And so for the virtual version of this event, we put people into breakouts and then they make their way through the data walk, responding and reacting to the information. They then, um, for the people who attended either in person or virtual, we asked them that same question I asked earlier around, who do you think would needs to see this information? 
who is it critical for? And so some people would name, you know, a municipal department. Oh, they need to see this. This really would impact their work. Oh, this group needs to see it. We don't think they have enough awareness of these issues. And so people named groups that they thought needed to see this data. And then we equipped them to host a, their own data walk with that group. And so uh, somebody uh, chose to do it with the senior center, for example. Another one chose to do it in a classroom. And so we said that with the virtual data walk, it was just open all the time. And so people could go through and add information. After the data walk happened, so some in-person, some virtual, some hosted virtual, uh, we then were able to synthesize it all together and then say, okay, based on that, here's what we heard. Um, and then we created a mini presentation. So for each of these key pieces of data, we had a, a summary of reactions and a summary of potential opportunities or things that could be uh, pursued. Um, and then we convened again another small group reflection session to look at those opportunities and say, um, how do we want to move these forward? So that's an, just another example of, of thinking about how we, when we think about iterative engagement, how do we do that? This was a, a visual I created to think about a, a virtual community of practice. And the thing that I want to point out is that when we have um, virtual and when we have engagement in general, there's things that we can do synchronously. So at the same time, you know, it's important that there are people coming together to do that. You know, those aligning type things, connecting. We need to be together at the same time to do that. But then there's things that can be asynchronous. Um, so this is you do them at different times. And so I, I think it's really helpful to think what's the what's uh, the things that we can do synchronously, what's the things that we can do asynchronously. And in order to have this iterative engagement, we're doing both. We're kind of bouncing back and forth between synchronous and asynchronous. So we're having a great session, then we're sharing out the notes, and then we're asking, sending out a live document and asking people to add comments. Um, then we take that and then we're building upon it. And so when we think about iterative engagement, the key points that I have is to plan multiple engagements rather than just one main event, plan for it being, you know, it's spreading, it building momentum, it trickling, and then bring that back together. So it's kind of like a release and then a bring back, make sense of it. Release, bring back, make sense. So build upon what you learn ask who needs to be involved, share what you're learning with the next group. Uh, and so that's the most respectful thing. If you keep um, seeing what you're learning, plan to learn through the process and share that with the next group you encounter and ask what else is needed. Um, so it allows us to be more emergent versus, um, you know, creating a plan and executing a plan. This is like the freedom. This is what this time allows us to do is to be more authentic with our engagement. And then as we empower others to engage, uh, we should invite people to host their own engagement. We don't need to be the holder of everything. We can, it, the engagement can, um, we can share that power. We can share that ability. Um, my favorite tool is, um, one of my favorite tools is 15% Solutions. This is a liberating structures tool. Um, oops, sorry. Uh, and we basically say at the end of the, an engagement, if our goal is to share this widely, what's something that you're already doing that you could enhance by just five to 15% to make that possible? So for example, my goal is to share this widely in a community. Um, what can I do? Oh, well, I'm already meeting with, um, you know, my women's group on Tuesday night. I can share that there. And so we, we ask this of a group. We say, here's the goal. What are you already doing that you could just enhance a little bit to help make this happen? And then we ask people to share their ideas in the chat and they name what they're intending to do. And then we release it. We, we say, great. We'll equip you. We'll send you the notes. We would love for you to do that. And so 15% Solutions is so powerful as a way to empower others to, to also work on something together. 
So two main things, how do we have more meaningful virtual engagement? How do we engage well in a hybrid world? I took up a little bit more time uh, than I expected, but I'm, wo I'm wondering if there's any questions in our last few minutes. Um, I saw one question about um, the tool about the bucketing, um, if that is available uh, online. Uh, I don't have that tool specifically written up, but that is something that I can do. The three key questions uh, are, uh, can we, is this something we can do ourselves? Is this something that we need support with? Or is this something we need somebody externally to lead? And so I create those three buckets as a way to, uh, to move uh, ideas uh, forward. Connor, did you see any other questions come up? Uh, nope, not for me, Lisa. Uh, just the only question from Michelle there. Uh, yeah, please, uh, if you have a question, please share them in the chat box and the Q&A panel. We have a few minutes remaining in the webinar. I've been loving uh, seeing the, the chat come in. Thank you for uh, your excitement around some of these tools as well. Thanks, Corinne. Yeah, I'm going to invite you, uh, we'll be sharing the slides shortly. And so when you think about any of those areas, um, you know, and kind of look at your own engagement and what's the area that you want to work on, uh, you can dive deeper into that. So whether it's virtual facilitation, you can read that page of tips. Uh, if it's about addressing some of the key barriers, uh, then you can read that guide. Uh, if it's about just being more, more um thoughtful or intentional when designing an engagement, I really invite you to use the, in, the engagement planning canvas and, you know, get together with a colleague and kind of um, brainstorm what could this be like. Um, awesome, thank you. From Pam, with the online fatigue, I just want to say that I really like the idea of starting with the must-haves. Uh, a great place to start. Thank you. Michelle's asking, have you found a specific tool more helpful when engaging youth? Uh, really great question. Um, I find that with youth engagement, whenever I think I know the best way to engage, it's never right. And so what I always do is I make sure I'm co-designing an engagement together with youth. Um, I will always think this, I, I think I get a specific person's face in my mind whenever I think about youth engagement. Uh, and she said, you know, I see, I, you know, I see the city, I see these organizations hosting events and maybe they're cool, maybe, maybe they're great, but just because they're hosted by, you know, the city, I'm just not going to want to go. You know, I, it's, it's like my grandma inviting me to a party and as great, as much as I love my grandma, I don't want to go. And she said, you know, connect with me. I'll host something if you want to learn that from other youth, you know, and I'll host it in a way that, you know, my peers would love. Um, and so it's been a really wonderful challenge uh, that, you know, I've said, I never want to be this outsider trying to engage a certain group. I always want to connect with somebody who um, is representative of a group and say, what would work for you? And I think that's also where the iterative engagement is so helpful because, you know, somebody can host their own thing that works for them. And I can say, here's what I care about. What do you care about? And let's do that together. Um, we also have, um, Connor, I'm going to challenge you with a really quick Google in our last minute. Uh, we co-created a youth engagement guide together with youth. Um, it's called Meaningfully Engaging Youth. Um, and it includes uh, principles for engaging youth um, and then also potential strategies or ways to overcome barriers that uh, we've heard organize, organizations share about engaging youth. And so together with youth, we brainstormed uh, some of those strategies together. Uh, and so that guide, uh, which is meaningfully engaging youth, uh, we'll share in the follow-up resources as well. Oh, good job, Connor. Uh, he's put it there in the chat. Awesome. Uh, I'm going to uh, hand, I think, back to Jennifer for, uh, for a thanks and a follow-up. 
Awesome. Well, thank you, Lisa, for this wonderful session today. Um, there really are some awesome concrete tools and suggestions uh, that I think we'll all be taking away with us. I also want to big, give a big shout out to Connor, who worked behind the scenes to ensure today's session ran smoothly. So thank you, Connor. Everyone needs a Zoom specialist like you. <laughs> uh, we invite you to check out our events page on the RPAP website for more, for more details um, and to register for some of our upcoming sessions in 2022. Holly will place a link in the chat box for you and we'll send it again with all of this um, in a follow-up. So once again, thank you to Lisa, the rural, the Alberta Rural Mental Health Network, and a big thanks to all of you for joining us today. It was a pleasure to host you all and I hope you all have a great rest of your day and we'll see you next year.